If you would please join me in Psalm 19. This will be a psalm of response. Let me get my hymnal up. You'll find the words on our screen here. We will not be doing the musical part of this psalm, so we'll be going uh, straight through it. You can find it also in your hymnal, page 750. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them God has set a tent for the sun, <clears throat> which comes forth like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its feet. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment <coughs> of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honey. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can understand one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Also, keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you so much, Julie, for your leadership and, and reading today and, and uh, for that word. And I would echo, as many a preacher does, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, last verse of Psalm 19. Let it be for me and for you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let me clear the pipes a little bit, right? Turn your attention to Mark 8, 27 through 38 today, and you'll see the scripture on the screen. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? 
Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, we often say we come to a fork in the road. I would not mind saying that the disciples have come to a cross in the road. Today's text is a pivotal moment in which the Gospel of Mark tells us that up until now things have been going rather smoothly for Peter and the disciples. Jesus has run off demons, he's performed miracles, he's told parables, and much more. But then Jesus asks a thought-provoking question, or one that uh, apparently was a little controversial among the disciples. He says, who do people say that I am? And some of them said, uh, Elijah, and some of them said, uh, the, one of the, John the Baptist, uh, who uh, had, had been killed by Herod, as you know. Others said, uh, one of the prophets. But Peter gets his chance, and Peter actually gets it right for a change. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> he says, you are the Messiah. Now, we remember when Peter said that, he didn't understand what the Messiah was going to do and be. He, he meant Messiah, meaning the one who's going to save Israel and return Israel to its former glory. He meant you're the one who's going to throw off the shackles of the Romans and bring us into power like the days of David and Solomon and things like this. So just by saying you are the Messiah, Peter is making a, a statement that he is the one. And Peter wants to get on with it. He was grown impatient. He wants the revolution to begin. Down with Rome, he might say. Power to the people, he might say. But then he hears Jesus explain that he's going to die. And Peter just, as the kids say, loses it. Loses his cool. There's no sword in Jesus' hand. No legion of angels to appear in the heavens to fight for the Romans, against the Roman soldiers. No great white stallion is rushing in to, for Jesus to jump on and, and ride off into victory. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Jesus' battle plans begin with talk of suffering and death and being rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and then to be killed. And I think at that point, Peter just turned off and stopped listening because he didn't seem to get the part about being raised in, in thir on the third day. Peter is horrified. How is this revolution going to happen if the Messiah is going to be tortured and killed? He must have wondered what Jesus was, why he was talking this way. So he's furious, and he pulls Jesus aside and begins to rebuke that, him. Now, <laughs> Peter's, Peter is quite the character, and we know that he's done a few bold things. But I'd say rebuking Jesus is about the boldest thing <laughs> anybody would ever try to do. Uh, and Peter was ill-advised to go up against Jesus. But that just goes to show you how, how upset he was. Well, he pulls Jesus aside, rebukes him. We don't know exactly what he says. Something probably like, you know, say it's not so, Lord, or something like that. Well, then Jesus takes Peter and goes so that he's within earshot of the other disciples. And he says, so everybody can hear, get behind me, Satan, for you've set your mind on human things, not on divine things. This revolution will be different. It will be unlike any the world has ever seen before. This revolution will uh, truly succeed in changing the world, but God will reclaim the world not through violence, but through suffering and death and ultimately resurrection. You know, I don't know if anybody had ever thought of saving the world that way until Jesus came along. 
Jesus will be known in this battle not for his prowess and violence on the battlefield, but by his obedience to God. He will conquer not just the Romans, because, you know, after the Romans, there's going to be somebody else. But he's going to conquer death itself. Amen? He's going to go up against the, the forces of evil and wickedness and Satan himself. And that's, that's a battle that no sword is going to win on the, the plains of, of Judea. This weapon will not be a sword, but will be self-denial and suffering love. Think about that. Self-denial and suffering love. The cross, which looked to Peter like defeat, will really be victory. Victory. Peter didn't get that. He wasn't listening or he didn't understand that last part about the Son of Man being risen up in three days. He just sort of tuned that out. <laughs> and, and you know, even if he did listen, he probably didn't know what it meant anyway, to be honest. Right after Jesus set Peter straight, he calls his disciples around him and these other followers besides the twelve, and he says, If any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and, do you remember what he says? Follow me. You know it well. Good job. You know your Bible is almost as good as the Baptist. Good job. He's going to show his way of resistance as he calls them to follow him. And that's his call to you and me today, to become followers of Jesus and his way. Rather than resisting him as Peter did at first, we are to be followers of the way. Followers. You know, in our Western culture, we don't make a big deal about followers. I don't think I've ever, you know, I, there's a whole section of books in a, in a, in a bookstore about leaders. And everybody's, you know, going to be a leader. And we talk about the importance of leadership. But, but there's no section that talks about followership except the, the Christian section. We don't imagine a commencement speaker getting up at graduation and saying, you are now going to be the future followers of America. No, we don't, do we? What do they say? You're going to be the future leaders of America. Jesus says the power is in following and sure, there's a place for leadership, but he says the power is in following. We are to be followers of the one Jesus who went to the way of the cross. During the struggle against apartheid, Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa used to gather his staff around and he'd uh, have a staff meeting and then he'd ask them a question at the end. He'd say, if being a Christian became a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? He was asking them, and he was asking himself, and, and he's asking us today to stay focused on who and they, we are and whose we are. That we're not simply leading an important struggle for dignity and justice, but we are followers of Jesus, the one who inspires the work of God in the world. They in, who fought apartheid were followers of Jesus who taught about the dignity of each person, which apartheid didn't uphold. In their situation, being a leader was not enough without being a follower of Jesus. Their witness was in how they followed Christ, not just in how they led others. And friends, if there's anything I want for all of us today, here and throughout the church worldwide, it's that we develop our followership. What if every church could be a center of Christian followership? A place where people learn to follow and teach others to follow Jesus. That's something I, I love about this book study Julie has in mind here. It, it's, it's about falling in love with God. Uh, and it's not about being a leader or, or taking authority over, 
over things in life or church or, or being the winner all the time. Jesus wasn't considered a winner by some people, was he? Following Jesus means leading a life with the cross deeply embedded in it. And by the cross, I mean the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus expects sacrifice from us. He calls on us to give up our lives because playing it safe is no longer an option. Jesus says to us, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. He said these words and words much like them several times. Maybe he had to repeat them to get them through to us because he sure didn't get them through to Peter that first time, did he? <laughs> so you're, and you and I are going to have to think as much about loving as being loved. To think as much of understanding as being understood. To think as much of forgiving as being forgiven. We're going to need to be, continue to be followers of this Jesus. In the last paragraph of his great book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes, This principle runs through all of life, from top to bottom. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose life, and it will be saved. Submit to death, the death of ambitions and secret wishes, and then he says these words, Keep nothing back. Nothing in us that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. He says, Look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Praise the Lord. Look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Believe in Jesus? Follow him. Want to know more about Jesus? Follow him. For we are called to walk his narrow way, his way of self-denial and cross-bearing. And then we will know him. And he will have his way with our lives. May it be so for you and for me and for all God's children everywhere. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.